Yeah. Okay. So we're going to start with uh, Peter Fana. He's going to talk about um, tensors and entanglement, um, yeah, asymptotic entanglement transformations. Peter, stage is yours. Thanks. Um, and thanks for organizing, first of all, and, and also for inviting me. And so making possible is this kind of online participation, which uh, otherwise it would have been difficult for me to, to participate. Um, I'm, I'm going to give the first part of a, of a series of two talks about the asymptotic entanglement transformations. Um, this will be more like an overview of, uh, of uh, results from a couple of papers rather than uh, the latest results from a, from a single one. So you know, uh, this is part, the, part of the idea is that you can um, maybe maybe put this to the next talk into a, a broader context if I first uh, like introduce these topics. Yeah, so you know, this is the rough outline of, of this talk. So I'll, there will be roughly three the topics uh, I'll be talking about sensor restriction, which uh, I guess most of you well know, and and and, and entanglement transformations, which uh, uh, you can think of as a kind of refinement of tensor restriction, as you will see in a moment. And and there are several questions which uh, like really got regarding uh, asymptotic rates of of like restrictions and entanglement transformations. Uh, where, so the keyword is, is asymptotic, and all these uh, questions and. And there are, there are actually three different regimes that happen to have a tool characterization in terms of uh, certain uh, monotone functionals I'll introduce. And then in the last part, I'll give you the, I'll, I'll tell you about all the known monotone functionals in, in these three uh, contexts. So um, a brief recap, and just to, um, to fix the notations. Um, so by tensor I'll just, uh, uh, so, so tensor will mean, mean just a, an element of a of the tensor product of k vector spaces. So k will be fixed throughout. Um, my tensors will be denoted by by psi and phi for for historical reasons. And there are two operations that will uh, be kind of interested in. Um, one of them is the tensor direct sum, which might be less familiar, and the tensor product, which might be more familiar. Um, the, the, the point is that in, in all these cases, if you start with all the k tensors, then the, the result of the sum and also the, the tensor product will be regarded as an order k tensor. So, there, so especially for the tensor product, there would be different possibilities, but this is the, the way we think about it. So one of the key concepts is the restriction of a tensor. So psi restricts to phi if there exists a bunch of linear maps mapping from, from one vector space to the corresponding one uh, for the other tensor. So that the tensor product takes psi into phi. And there's a special kind of tensor which, um, you know, which uh, kind of pops up in this, this problem. Um, and that's called the unit tensor, which looks like this when where F is the, the ground field. And these, these EIs are some bases in the local. So I, I will refer to these, these spaces as the local ones, so the local uh, vector spaces. So the J should be a K in, the, in that line about restriction. This one, uh, yeah, very good, yes. So you know that we're still here. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So there's this little picture that uh, helps you imagine what the tensor direct sum is, so how it looks like. Um, you, can, you can think of a tensor as a, like a, I mean, some people like to think of tensor as a bunch <laughs> of numbers. <laughs> Num num is uh, arranged in a in like a cuboid, and then the direct sum just means that you take uh, these cubes like etched like a uh, vertex to vertex, so that they touch. Yeah, so there will be some things special in this talk, and namely, uh, these vector spaces will actually be finite dimensional complex inner product spaces, or, or like one can say that these are Hilbert spaces as well. Um, and I'll change the notation to these calligraphic letters H and K again for historical reasons. <laughs> and then, when, whenever we in encounter these direct sums and tensor products, then we, we should also think of them as table spaces by by taking the these these to be orthogonal direct sums and and the table space tensor products. So that's a way to to make this an inner product space as well. Um, and importantly. This unit tensor will 
So when, when I write this as a unit tensor, uh, that will mean a, a particular one, which happens to be defined by an orthonormal basis. So these are orthonormal basis. Mm -hmm. You might have uh, noticed that this F just changed to, to C to reflect this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so um, this will be a, a gentle introduction to entanglement transformations. Uh, I'll try to, to describe this thing in terms that most of you might be familiar with. Um, so what you can see here is, is uh, what I would call an LOCC protocol, where LOCC is short for local operations and classical communication. Um, so so this, here are the rules. So you're given a, a rooted tree, and the vertices are labeled by uh, by these uh, tensor legs or, or subsystem indices, if you like, and the edges are labeled by by operators on the on, on this little bit space, uh, subject to the following constraints. Uh, so for each edge, you look at the vertex where it starts from. For example, here's uh, an edge E, and it starts from B. So we recall that this B has a label, a subsystem label, and uh, the operator that is associated with uh, with this E must live in uh, in, in this uh, this space of operators, which does which is a subset of the of the space of operators acting on on the on the whole Hilbert space. So this inclusion is by tensor ring with identities everywhere. Mm -hmm. And the second condition is that whenever you you pick a vertex and you look at all the edges that that uh, that start at this vertex and then take this funny sum that must be less than the identity. Yeah, so that's what I, I call an LOCC protocol. And then what you can do with this is, is you can feed a tensor into, into this, which means the following thing. So you're given a, a tensor. And then you, you, you define uh, uh, like tensors that correspond to each vertex, the following rules. The root is, uh, is given the, the, the tensor you started with. And whenever you have an edge from, from V to W, so like here, uh, then the tensor corresponding to W will be Ke times tensor corresponding to V. Right. So in this way, what you get is that uh, at each vertex, you get a, a particular restriction of, of your initial tensor. And what we'll be interested in are, are the leaves and the, the, the tensors associated with the, with the leaves under this recipe. And here are the, the definitions. So now, without really losing much generality, we can assume these tensors to have norm one. So we call that we live now in Hilbert spaces, so these tensors have a norm. And so we can assume this to be to be norm one. And sometimes one talks about a, a state vector in this case. And we'll say that psi can be transformed into phi with a epsilon error if this condition is satisfied. So you sum over all the leaves. Uh, this is what is called the overlap between between phi and the, the tensor corresponding to that, that leaf. And that has to be at least one minus epsilon. Um, and, and the second thing that one can define with this uh, in this picture is that, so again, psi can be transformed into phi exactly with probability P. If, well, first of all, for all leaves, you must have a multiple of your, of your target state phi. And then if you sum the coefficients, the, the squares of the, these coefficients, then it must be at least P. So you can think of these, uh, these coefficients, which are basically the norms of, of these uh, vectors associated to, with, uh, with the vertices as probabilities. And then you just add up these probabilities that must be at least P. Is that clear? Yeah, so as I said before, at, at each of the, the vertices, you get a tensor, which is a restriction of, of so as, as we saw before, so these, um, well, this is uh, true for every edge that, uh, the, the tensor at the at the endpoint of the edge is a restriction of the tensor at the at the, at the starting point of the edge. So, in, in particular, everything will be a restriction of of psi. So, um, um, the the end result is that if there is at least one uh, leaf that has a non-zero vector, then it must be the case that psi restricts to to phi as well, and and vice versa. 
So in this sense, uh, this is the refinement of the restriction uh, relation. Um, so we can we can ask th three problems uh, in the asymptotic regimes corresponding to, to all these kinds of uh, transformations. So first is the, the asymptotic restriction problem given two tensors. Uh, the task is to decide whether one can whether, whether there's a restriction from like uh, n copies of psi to n copies of phi up to a sublinear number of copies of the of, of some some fixed unit tensor or or, or like a single unit tensor of sub-exponential rank. And, and the second one concerns the probabilistic transformations. So that's a, in, in the sense of the second one. Uh, and what is called a strong converse regime is, is that uh, what the, I'll be particularly interested in, given again, uh, let's say unit vectors psi and phi and an error exponent r, so that's a non-negative number. Is there a, a transformation from from this vector to to phi tensor n with a with a certain probability that the case exponentially governed by this exponent? Um, and the third problem involves um, ent entanglement transformations in the, in the approximate sense. And the question again, given unit unit uh, like norm one tensors psi and uh, and phi, uh, is there a transformation from Psi tensor n to phi tensor n, uh, again up to a small um, like unit tensor, normalized in this case with a with, with error that goes to zero. Yeah. So, so in the next part, I'll be talking about these, these dual characterizations that I mentioned in the beginning. Um, so, as it happens in all three cases, there are quite natural kinds of uh, monotone quantities that uh, uh, make you like. That, that you can use to show that a certain transformation is not possible. And, and, the, and the, the point here is that one can show that these uh, like collectively form a complete set of monotones. So basically, in a nutshell, that's uh, what the next few slides are about. So in the first case, so in, the, in the asymptotic restriction problem, you introduce the semi-ring of tensors. I'll be doing this in a slightly non-standard way, but in the end, it's it's equivalent to uh, to the to what you can find in the literature. So I'll take a S to be the set of all the K tensors up to product unitary transformations. So I'll make these things equivalent to each other. So whenever phi is some some uh, like order K tensor, and this U run up to U K are unitaries, then uh, this this uh, particular kind of restriction. Uh, will be declared to be equivalent to the original one, right? So normally you would uh, allow like adding zero tensors and and, and also like um, general linear transformations, but in the end it doesn't matter. You can you, you still get the same ring in this case, and, and the the end result is the same. And so when I say same ring, that means that this is a a pre-ordered commutative same ring actually. With units and zero, uh, where the, the sum operation is induced by the by the tensor direct sum, and the product operation is induced by the tensor product, and the, the preorder is induced by restrictions, and what you get is a preorder semi ring. So that means that uh, these operations uh, and the preorder are compatible with each other in a sense. And then one goes on to introduce the asymptotic preorder, which is exactly the exactly encodes the problem that I just mentioned in the previous slide that psi is bigger than phi asymptotically if psi tensor n restricts to phi tensor n up to the sub-exponential size unit tensor. Yep, so um, here are the kinds of monotons that, uh, that, I, that I meant before. And the set of, of, of certain monotons is called the asymptotic spectrum of tensors and uh, you define it by the set of so that's just a set of, of monotone semi-ring homomorphisms to the non-negative reals from S. So in detail, that means that unit tensors are mapped to uh, the corresponding uh, natural number, which is also a real number. So maybe I forgot to mention that unit tensor can be thought of as a uh, direct sum of, of smaller unit tensors, namely uh, a unit tensor of size one. You know, so you can, you can also restrict to that one. So in any case, there's this kind of normalization condition. 
and it has to be additive under the direct sum and multiplicative under the tensor products and monotone under restrictions. So if psi restricts to phi, then, um, then f of psi must be at least as large as f of phi. And you, you take the collection of all these monotone fun functionals. So what's a simple observation is that these monotones provide abstractions for a synthetic restriction. So even though they are defined in terms of, of, of restriction without the asymptotic one, thanks to the fact that they are multiplicative, you, know, you can you, know, you can rearrange this a bit. So by multiplicativity, this is equal to 2 to the little o n, f of psi to the n, and then taking n throughs and letting n go to infinity, you get f of psi bigger than f of phi in the end. But the big thing is a, is a kind of converse result for this. Namely, uh, this asymptotic free order is equivalent to, uh, to this kind of ordering between the, the monotones, but for all of them. And uh, maybe I'll say a word about a proof that there's, so in this paper of, of Schassen, there's a, an abstract result proved about pre-ordered centerings, basically. And this is a special case of that result. So you can observe that uh, this kind of asymptotic pre-order makes sense for, for many kinds of, of pre-ordered centerings. Um, so the second problem was uh, what, that I mentioned was uh, the strong converse regime. So when we want to control these errors, you know, these exponential decaying errors. So maybe maybe I should mention that in the previous problem, you, you can also think about these entanglement transformations, but um, you somehow lose a lot of information about these probabilities. You, you, you only keep the, you're only interested in whether the transformation succeeds with probability one, well, uh, sorry, so with non zero probability or, or it doesn't. So, in, in this, this more refined problem, you're interested in, in how exactly uh, the probability behaves. Um, so, again, I, I form the same pre order semi ring. Um, so, it's the same semi ring structure, but with a different pre order. Namely, I declare psi to be bigger than phi if the normalized versions can be transformed with probability given by the ratio of the norm squared. So recall that these, these squared uh, absolute values have this interpretation of probabilities. And so that's why this norm squared appears here. So that's what encodes the probabilities in this, uh, in this uh, formulation. And what you get is again a pre-ordered semi ring. And, and it turns out that you can so you can uh, also define the asymptotic pre-order and then characterize the strong converse rate in terms of the asymptotic pre-order, namely with a certain error exponent, you can, uh, so this, this strong converse rate means that you, you, the number of copies of phi that you get per copy of psi. That's, uh, that's the idea. So as you can see here, you divide the number of copies of phi by the number of copies of psi and take the supremum. And the two to the r, that should be a square root here, sorry. Yeah, because you, you square the norms. So that should be a square root here, and, and then you get exactly this, this strong compass rate. And what you can do here is, again, you can introduce the asymptotic spectrum of this pre-ordered semi-ring, you know, like uh, in the hope of getting a characterization of, of these uh, strong compass rates. So up to this point is the same as before. So you get this normalization by, at, at the unit tensors. And this is the, uh, the point where it gets important that, um, that the unit tensor is defined in terms of an uh, orthonormal basis, because that will be the, the direct sum of several copies of the unit of the semi-ring. Um, you get formally the same additivity and multiplicativity and, and well, uh, monotonicity as well. But uh, remember that this field is different now than the one we had before. Um, at first sight, this is kind of a complicated condition because this uh, pre-order was defined in a like in terms of these these uh, these rooted trees, and and there's no uh, bound on the on the depth of this tree that you could uh, you could put. But uh, but it turns out that this condition can be replaced by by much simpler ones, namely these. So one of them is a kind of scaling property that whenever you multiply your tensor by square root of p, uh, then, and then the function must pick up a factor of p to the alpha for some exponent between 0 and 1. And then uh, this is really what the, the monotone in the city condition becomes. That would be a kind of inequality. Uh, 
given by by all the tensors and and local projections where local we might like uh, recall that the, the these local projections mean that you take a projection on one of the Hilbert spaces and you tensor the with the identity of the rest and again you can you can say that the same observation that whenever there is an asymptotic restriction then um, for the same reason uh, you get an inequality between the, the, the monotones even though they are defined in terms of of the non-asymptotic pre-order and, and much in the same way as before we have a, a dual characterization in terms of these monotones the stronger confidence rate can be expressed as an infimum over the asymptotic spectrum and here you can see the square root appeared so that should have been there before as well so it's quite quite uh, quite similar this so R, this what's the meaning of R again? It's like the success rate. Like so the, that, that's what uh, is called the, the error exponent. So that means okay. that when you start with n copies of psi, uh, you you get the, the, the desired uh, state with probably at least two to the minus R times n. Okay. So it okay. sounds kind of bad because it does decay exponentially, but at least you know this exponent. Like yeah. you, you control this exponent. Mm -hmm. And of course, you might hope that if R goes to zero, then you might get some sensible reads that. Yeah, so strictly speaking, uh, when, when you put just R equals zero, then you you, you don't get the exact transformations of probability one, but with, with a probability that decays sub exponentially. But uh, like in, in special cases, one can actually prove that you, in that case, you get a probability that goes to one mm -hmm. at the same rate. So it's not, not, not all hope is lost. Yeah, and and uh, now to the last problem where you, uh, so this is a kind of different thing because you now allow approximations. You don't want to end up with the, the exactly the, the tensor that you, that you picked, that is this phi, but the, you want to get very close to, to this. So in, in a sense, this is the physically most relevant kind of limit that uh, one would really be interested in. And, so the basic idea goes back to Shannon and this, this kind of approximately vanishing error is, is due to him. Yeah, so in this case, there's no centering available, but you still get, you, you can still make a, a, an, an oldest commutative monoid for um, these states. Um, so in this case, now we restrict to tensors that have norm one, so that remember that we, we, we could call that the, the state vectors in this case. They have norm one, and there's a an operation on the in, in this monoid that, of course, I mean some people would like to call this a plus because it's a commutative monoid. But um, since previously we had, we had a tensor product and that was a multiplication, I, I just skip this notation. Um, and now the not so nice trick is that you define the pre-order in terms of asymptotic transformations that with the error going to zero. And then you can define the asymptotic pre-order, which uh, looks like it introduces an additional level of, of, of asymptotic thing because we want this for, for all large n. Um, but in, in the end, you can also phrase it as a single kind of asymptotic transformation. But uh, so the difference between the, the the original pre-order and the asymptotic one is that you allow this sublinear number of of, uh, of, the, of this standard states, this, this normalized unit tensor. So in, in, in quantum information, people call this the GAZ state. Yeah, and, and there's nothing really special about this state, actually. Um, and it turns out that also in this case, you can get a characterization of, of this trace in terms of suitable monotones. So in this case, you take a set of normalized monotone homomorphisms where normalized means this and it's actually not that important um, i mean so basically these uh, with, without this condition you would get a cone of, of functionals and and you just cut this to a, into a compact subset that generates this cone um, and now somehow i'm mixing this additive and multiplicative notation which might be confusing uh, but uh, again, for historical reasons, this is what I'm doing. Um, so on, on the tensor product, your functional must evaluate to the sum of the, of the individual ones. And they must be monotone. And again, it turns out that you can 
replace this ugly condition of being monotone under asymptotic transformations with a, a much simpler ones, um, which is this one. Okay, it doesn't look any simpler, but but it is. So again, the point is that um, you only need to verify inequalities for all tensors and all local projections in, instead of uh, this uh, unmanageable set of asymptotic LCC transformations. Uh, but then you need to add a condition that is called the asymptotic continuity, which is a certain kind of continuity estimate on, uh, on these functionals. So, uh, or, or more precisely, this is really a, a like a uniform continuity condition with respect to a certain uniform structure. Um, but in the end, it turns out that you actually don't even really need to care about this one because it's kind of surprisingly it can be replaced by an algebraic condition, which is this one. Mm -hmm. So now you cannot take simply direct sums of the tensors because that would uh, change the norm and we want to restrict to, to norm one tensors. But you can take direct sums with these coefficients square root of pi square root of one minus p, p sorry. Um, and that, uh, that, is, that still has norm one when psi and phi have and then you get this kind of algebraic condition where uh, the binary entropy appears. So it's quite uh, surprising, I would say, that these that un un under these conditions, this one is equivalent to, to this asymptotic continuity. Mm -hmm. And then uh, an, an observation is that whenever you have these asymptotic transformations, then uh, this function was to not increase. So this time it's a bit, it requires a bit more work, but, but it does work. Yeah, and uh, and you have the corresponding theorem here as well that uh, this kind of transformation is possible, well, like asymptotically. I mean, this maybe not maybe a bit misleading this notation. So asymptotically, with vanishing error, uh, it's possible if and only if for all these functionals we have you know the, the corresponding inequalities, so the ones that were necessary conditions that turn out to be sufficient when taken collectively. And the proof goes by, well, in, part of it is a reduction to uh, to a nice result in the theory of ordered commutative monoids by Tobias Fritz. And, uh, but, but somehow it isn't, um, it's not just a special case of some big theory, but we really need some tricks that are specific to this problem. And so, so that's kind of unfortunate that we don't have a, a big theory that would um, just specialize to this. Yeah, so one, one thing that one might wonder is why I'm actually talking about all these three problems at the same time. And the reason is that they are related to each other. So these, and that, that can be best seen via these, these dual, these dual characterizations. Okay. So, yep. No, I was sneezing. <laughs> Sorry. <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> well. Uh, bless you. Um, <laughs> so in, 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 the, in the in the second case, when the asymptotic spectrum, so you we might recall that there were these alpha exponents. So you can just define a function that extracts this exponent from the function. Uh, formally, it looks like this: you take the unit tensor of rank one, uh, multiplied by square root of two, evaluate the function, and take the logarithm. So it kind of by definition gives that specific exponent alpha that corresponds to this function. Um, so that will give a function from the asymptotic spectrum of, of LCC transformations to, um, to the zero one interval. And the pre-image of zero is, is exactly the asymptotic spectrum of tensors. So that's the subset of, of these monotones. And uh, maybe even more interestingly, if we take a sequence uh, in, in such a way, I mean, the sequence of, of points in this uh, asymptotic spectrum that have the property that their exponents tend to one. I hope you didn't read all this uh, in advance. Um, so, um, sorry. So, so we assume. So, one of the things that we assume is that the exponents go to one, and the second is that for all uh, uh, tensors of norm one, uh, this kind of uh, limit exists. So, that's basically a kind of derivative of but well basically that's, that is a derivative of of some some curve at at uh, at, at alpha equals one if 
if this is not just a sequence but a curve. So anyway, if, if this limit exists, then what you get is a point in the in the set of asymptotically continuous functionals. So the ones relevant to the third problem. Um, so one of the obvious questions is whether every element of F arises in this way, or do you get more elements by that, that are not at this type of limits? I don't know this. So the curly F is the one where you took a monoid, right? Exactly. Yeah, and maybe a remark that if you take the take an element from this this uh, script F, then that's essentially a derivation of uh, of the same ring of of tensors at the norm squared, like up to a simple transformation. I mean, I guess you might, you you know what the derivation is by now. Yeah, um, example. So I, I think so far everything was very abstract. Uh, maybe it's a good. Uh, idea to have a few examples now and actually we're, we are in a very fortunate uh, position that at least for for all the two tensors there's a complete description of all these sets um, so the first one is kind of trivial it's classical linear algebra that there is a single point in the asymptotic spectrum of tensors for uh, for all the two tensors and that's called the rank of, of this tensor <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, what's a bit more interesting is uh, in the in the LCC case you get uh, an interval of like a, so like a line of of, uh, of these these monotone functions and uh, sorry for again this uh, kind of physicistism that I used here. Um, so what happens here is that uh, an order to tensor has uh, what is called a singular value decomposition, and you take the singular values to the uh, to the power two alpha and some demo, and that's what is written here. And so when alpha is, is zero, then you get back the rank, and when alpha is one, then you get uh, the norm squared, and you get a family interpolating between the two, basically. And and there's another way to to view these uh, these monotone functionals, which is uh, which I which I find very useful. Um, this is again a form of the singular value decomposition. So you can you can phrase it in, in this way that psi is equivalent to to uh, to the special form, so up to local unitaries on both sides, where these p's are just some positive numbers, and, and their sum is equal to the norm squared of of the tensor. And uh, you can write the rank in this funny way. You take the zero entropy of p and and exponentiate. You know, of course, you you would never do this if you just look at uh, the asymptotic restriction problem in itself. But uh, but this kind of pattern works for for all these monotones as well. Like uh, like the ones in between are exponentiated uh, linear entropies between zero and one. And uh, and actually, there there's a limit of of these linear entropies, which is in the spirit of of these limits that I showed on the previous slide. And that's called the Shannon entropy, um, and which happens to be the unique element of of F in this case. So there's again a single point in that case, just like in the case of of the of the asymptotic restriction problem. So that's what happens for for all the or the two tensors. Yeah, well, what happens for all the three tensors? So the first thing you can do for higher order tensor is uh, you can flatten them. Like a cube is a really complicated object. If you flatten it, you get a square or like a rectangle. And uh, in this way, you can regard an order three tensor as, as an order two tensor in three different ways. So this is what is depicted here. You get these three lines corresponding to the to, to these monotones. For each flattening, you get one line. And they, they are not disjoint, but their endpoint is you know, the, the endpoint of all of them is the the norm square because flattening doesn't change the norm so you get the same number by flattening in one way and evaluating the norm or, or doing it in another way <laughs> so you get these three lines um, but you you get more interesting things so what, what uh, you can see here in this region uh, there's a bunch of functionals interpolating between the ranks of, of these flattening ranks introduced by by uh, Matthias and co-authors, 
some of them present in the audience, some of them <laughs> present in the, at the stage. Um, so anyway, so you get this this family of, of functions that interpolate between them, and and at this point, this uh, this kind of tetrahedron is hollow. There's no nothing in sight, uh, but on the next uh, the next stage, uh, you actually get these kinds of interpolating functions between all, all four corners of this tetrahedron. Yeah. So in a nutshell, what you do is you take the sure variety composition of of uh, multiple copies of a of a local table space. So that's uh, decomposition uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, well ir irreducible representations of this product group or equivalently isotopic uh, components with respect to one group or the other one. And, and let's call these orthogonal projections corresponding to this direct sum, you know, this p h j sub lambda. Yeah, and um, you get to you need a parameter which has a which covers this convex combination. So in, in this previous picture, when you had this triangle, that was a uh, parameterized by the distributions on on three letters, and and this is what you do: you apply products of these these true wide projections onto the tensor powers of your state or your tensor. And the only thing you look for is whether you get zero or not. And whenever you get a non-zero number, well, sorry, non-zero tensor here, um, then, then you're happy. And when you're happy, you compute the, the entropy of the normal, normalized versions of these, uh, these partitions and take uh, the convex combination with respect to these weights. And once you have all these numbers, you just take the supremum and exponentiate, and that's it. So it's very easy. Uh, what's the, the, the second thing is slightly more complicated. So in, in the previous case, we only looked at whether this, uh, this vector is, is zero or not, or whether this tensor is zero or not, when you apply the, the local true right projections into tensor power of your tensor. Uh, and this time, I will be interested in the, the size of what you get. So the size means uh, the norm squared again. And it turns out that these um, these numbers uh, like they satisfy a large deviation principle, and, and um, what that means is basically that uh, this is approximately some decaying exponential um, that uh, de depends on on the tensor and uh, the normalized point that uh, you apply these projections. So very roughly, this is the idea. Of course, there's a more precise way to write down this rate function. Um, and this is what you do with them. So now your parameters will be a distribution on, on this uh, disk, uh, k letters, or like the k subsystems, plus um, an additional parameter alpha, which uh, which is the same as the exponent that we had before. Or like in, in information theory terms, it is called the order of this, um, this quantity. Um, and again, what you do is, is very similar. You, you take the supremum of this convex combination of entropies, but you subtract uh, a kind of penalty that depends on this rate function. So I, I won't uh, tell you much about this rate function, but maybe one thing to note is that this will be zero and whenever uh, you're outside of, of the set that you optimized uh, in, in, in the previous construction. And then you you exponentiate in the same way with this one minus alpha in the exponent. So maybe it's worth noting that when alpha goes to zero, you get back the previous the quantum functionals that were on the previous slide. And when alpha goes to one, then these things will have a limit, and it's just the the complex combination of of the marginal entropies. So the supremum goes over all lambdas. We don't select on whether the projections are not zero. So that's encoded in this i. So this condition means that when, when this is zero, like when it's, it's asymptotically zero, then this rate function is infinite. Uh -huh. And then that's not where the supremum is attained. So you don't need to, to, right. to restrict. But in effect, yes, you 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 can restrict to the entanglement polytope of, 
Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so in the limit when alpha goes to one, if you take the exponentiated version, then you always get the norm squared. But the right uh, kind of limit that you you should take is is without exponentiating, or or more precisely without this factor of one minus alpha. And then it it turns out to to depend on on this parameter theta. So this again points to the idea that one should take the previous picture and, and magnify the spectrum at the uh, norm squared by by considering this transformed version of, of the functionals instead of the functions by themselves. So you get a modified picture. So previously this this hatched region was a, a single point, the, the norm squared. Now we took a, a what's called or what's closely related to what is called the blow up of of this uh, this shape. You get this kind of picture where, uh, and now I changed the the ranks to to these entropies again because of this exponentiation. But the green so, area is still one point, no? Like it's one element. So. Uh, well, it, well, uh, it's blow up. It, it's blow it depends up. on where. Yeah. So that's a blow up of, of, of one element. So what happens here, maybe more more mathematically speaking, is that. Uh, you take the union of the, of the asymptotic spectrum minus the norm with with these kinds of derivatives that you get. Mm -hmm. um, and there's an actual topology there that doesn't make it a disconnected space, but yeah. so you really get this kind of shape. Yeah, so the point here is that you get uh, a little, little bit more uniform uh, way of, of, uh, of calling these, these vertices. You have the zero entropies and the one entropies and the alpha entropies in between on the edges. Here you really have convex combinations of, of these three entropies. Whereas here you don't get the convex combinations of, of the spectral points, of course. Mm -hmm. but, but on this end, it's they are really the convex combinations. Because uh, well, but this... I think I, I, might, I might have said before that this uh this set of the continuous functionals, they form a convex set. But are they useful, the convex combinations of, of those one entropies? Like, do they give more information? No. Okay. Well, yeah, it depends on, on what. So I think um, they they really hint at the existence of, of the things in like in between in here, which are useful. They do give more information. But at yeah. the end point, yes, that, that's true that they don't. Yeah, so here's just a, a brief uh, recap of what we can see in this uh, in these pictures. The first thing is that this quantum function was from a convex set. Uh, in, in what sense? So more precisely, what you do is for any subset of, of the semarine, you can consider the, the logarithmic evaluation maps uh, from the spectrum to R to the X, which uh, does what its, its name says. It evaluates and takes the logarithm, um, and then when when x separates the, the points in the spectrum, so you get sufficiently many elements of the semarine so that you can distinguish between the the spectral points. Then this this uh, evaluation function will be homo homeomorphism on this image, and, and maybe one could say that a subset of of the SMT spectrum is is log convex if there exists a separating set. And such that this uh, the image under this this uh, evaluation map is convex. I think that's a, that sounds like a reasonable definition of uh, of uh, what it means for a for a spectrum or a, or a subset of a spectrum to be convex. And then in this sense, the quantum functions are convex with respect to uh, the semi-stable tensors. But there are other possible choices here, but that's maybe the shortest. Yeah, in a, in a very similar sense, the, the asymptotic spectrum of matrix multiplication tensors is log star shaped. Again, there exists a separating set, such that, et cetera. Yeah, so that was mainly a remark on, on what this means. Uh, the second thing that we can see in this picture is that that the functionals, that the, at least the no, known functionals, form families parameterized by, by this, this order parameter, which goes from zero to one and connects the uh, like the quantum functionals with the with the convex combinations of these three extremal uh, asymptotically continuous ones. 
Yeah. Yeah. The third thing is I, I just um, make a note here, which I, which is kind of obvious that uh, this these functionals are, are convex, the, the asymptotic, the continuous ones form a convex set because because all the the conditions are affine uh, and that we we get an affine bijection between the between the zero and the one part. Right, so here you get this obvious convex structure. Here you get this non-obvious convex structure. But but uh, the bijection given by these these families or just following these lines is a uh, is a fine. Um, so the the natural question is whether these uh, are true in general. Like, uh, so th remember that this these are uh, like features extracted from the known parts of these uh, of these spectra. Um, there might be other. Uh, functionals that, that violate these. But in any case, this uh, kind of gives hint, hints where to look for new elements of the spectrum. Yeah, and yeah, so basically, because these were, uh, these, these conclusions were drawn from their k equals three case, we cannot expect them to give many more ideas on, on the k equals three case, except for the fact that we know that for f, there exists other functionals. So maybe that's something to look at. But if one could find explicit fun functionals in F, then uh, a reasonable question is whether they also have alpha equals zero analogs or not. Unfortunately, we don't know explicitly other points in, in F, but, but we know that there exist. Um, so maybe a more e easy way or like a, 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 in a direction orthogonal to what one would really like to go, uh, we can change the order of the tensors where or the this picture gives um, hints for where to look for new uh, new monotones. Um, actually, how much time do I have? Do I have any time left? Uh, six minutes. Very good. <laughs> okay, so um, um, so what what happens when you look at all the k tensors? So the big difference between two, three, and four is that, um, so you can flatten in, in many more ways than the, the number of subsystems. So let's call uh, a pair of sets a bipartition if like, a, so one of them is the complement of the other with respect to K and uh, none of them are, are the empty set. So that's a kind of proper bipartition, but it's a way of partitioning uh, the set of K subsystems into into two parts. Um, and of course, they label the flattenings. These are the poss possible flattenings of, of, uh, of the tensor. And for k subsystems, you have 2 to the k minus 1 minus 1. Oh, so you have 2 to the k minus 1 minus 1 bipartitions or flattenings, but only k elementary bipartitions of this, this, this special form. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and so when, when you look at these, uh, sorry, well, well, well whatever so when you look at these uh these bipartite ring entropies and you you can form them for all bipositions and and in f you can take convex combinations so you might you get this uh kind of bigger convex set whereas the quantum and the other cc functionals the this uh, striped and the shaded region uh, are only defined for for theta supported in, on elementary bipartitions it's not known how to extend them so it would be nice to extend the definition to to all the bipartitions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here's a picture for well, like a simplified picture for k equals four, where you can see all these things. So this is a these are the the elementary bipartitions, and you get the quantum functionals interpolating between them. Uh, these are the corresponding um, asymptotically continuous ones, and then you can also interpolate between all these. But there are additional bipartitions, and it's not known how they fit in the picture, except for for the right hand side, where you can take all the complex combinations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think this picture suggests that when, that there should be a way to extend these quantum functionals to mm -hmm. uh, to all bipartitions. Yeah. So I, I think that's what I wanted to. That's all I wanted to say. So. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for uh, for listening. Any questions? Any quick questions, Peter? Yeah. 
Well, I guess. yeah, maybe this is good idea, but also feel free to just refer to the paper or something. But I wonder how you get um, from uh, in the approximate case from just the monotonicity uh, under the asymptotic um, um, transformations to asymptotic continuity. We've seen Satroy like a stronger, a kind of very strongly uniform kind of continuity, right? Um, so very roughly, the idea is that whenever you have two states that are close to each other, then you can you can pick another state uh, that you can transform like one one to the other. Basically, that's the, the kind of the idea that you can you take some additional state and then. Um, then find an asymptotic transformation and that gives you bounds. So it uses things that are quite specific to LOCC. Yes, and... It's really, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't even extend that to, to mixed states. So, mm -hmm. so you, you can ask the same problem for, for mixed states as well, which I, I didn't talk about, but um, I don't even know how to extend in, to, to that case. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thanks again.